how it walked out like I did before. Several years ago, I had read about the restoration of the sergeant murals at the Boston Public Library, and I had gone in to see them. Unfortunately, tours were not being given that day. I'm glad I went back another time to see them. The tour cannot begin to explain everything represented in these murals. Books have been dedicated to explaining them. And then there was an exhibit of Sargent's work at the MFA, which increased my interest in this artist. One of America's most famous painters did not even see America until he was 20 years old. He was born on January 12, 1856 in Florence, Italy, where his parents had gone after their first child, a daughter, had died. They had planned to stay in Europe for a short while, but John's mother was happier there and they never moved back. His father was Fitzwilliam Sargent, a physician and author from Gloucester and Boston. He was from a family of very successful ship owners and merchants whose fortune was made in the fish and molasses trade. During the Revolutionary War, Winthrop Sargent was General Washington's agent on Cape Ann, and members of the family sent out at least 23 privateers who were very successful against British ships. Their fortune grew in the East India trade. His mother was Mary Newbold Singer of Philadelphia. Because the family moved often to warm places in winter and cooler places in summer, John and his two younger sisters experienced different countries and learned different languages. By the time John was a teenager, he could speak French, German, and Italian almost as well as he spoke English. John was a shy boy who find, found it hard to make friends, especially since his family moved so often. And he was taught at home by tutors and his parents. His mother, Mary, taught him art, but she had no idea that one day he would become a famous artist. Since John would rather explore the outdoors than sit inside and study, she told her son to always carry his sketchbook and draw whatever he saw. He could begin as many sketches as he wished each day, but she insisted that one be finished. So he drew every place where he ever lived or visited, every hillside, beach, every town square. He drew for many hours every day, a habit that would continue his entire life. He experimented with watercolor when he was 12 or 13, connecting what he saw with his feelings and developing his style. He also learned to entertain himself with music. Because he wanted to hear music often, he became an excellent pianist. When John was 18, he decided to study art seriously, and so he went to school in Paris, where his teacher, the well-known artist, Carlos Duran, recognized his talent immediately. At the time, Carlos Duran was working on a ceiling painting in the Luxembourg Palace. He used the heads of his favorite students, including John's, in that painting. However, John's is no longer there. His teacher especially liked to paint John's hands and often sent for him to come and pose, even after John was no longer his student. One day, John, who had begun to get work of his own, could not leave his studio at a moment's notice. This angered Duran, who went to the palace and painted over John's head. Duran had encouraged John to focus on portraits. So one of the first portraits exhibited publicly was that of Duran. John became known for capturing his subject's personality. He was to make a good living painting portraits of wealthy people. He painted more than 500 portraits in his lifetime. When he was 20 years old, he finally saw the United States. It was 1876, and his mother thought the country's 100th birthday would be a good time to visit. This was the first of many visits to America. Sometimes he would stay for more than a year, but he always went back to Europe. Back in Paris at the age of 21, 
Sargent entered paintings in the salon, the most important art show of the year. There was room after room packed with art. Sculptures crowded the floors and the walls were covered with paintings right up to the ceiling. Thousands of people attended. Sargent's paintings were immediately noticed and the critics praised them. When John was 23, he was six feet tall, broad shouldered and very serious looking. He had grown a full beard and mustache and he no longer dressed like a student. He wore a jacket, vest and tie even when he painted. In the 1880s, people had their portraits painted to show that they were rich and powerful. They were not so eager for the finished product to be completely realistic. And so they often told the artist exactly how they wanted to look. For men, this was solid, serious, and dependable. They wanted their wives to look beautiful and their children smart and well-behaved. Most important of all, they did not want to look unusual in any way. Sargent, the preeminent society portraitist of his generation, tried to do as they wished but he could not help being attracted to whatever was out of the ordinary. In 1879, Sargent went on a long trip to Spain in search of more exotic people. From Spain, he traveled to Morocco and Tunisia. He once rode on horseback for days to reach a small village because he had heard it had many interesting buildings. He drew and painted everything he saw. He wanted to do more than capture the appearance of these things. He wanted to share the experience of walking on a hot, dusty Moroccan dirt street or sitting in a dim cafe in Spain and watching a beautiful young woman dance. He wanted people to imagine the rhythm of the, the, the guitars and the sound of the dancers' feet on the wooden floor. Back in Paris, people liked these paintings. They did not mind if people from other countries looked exotic. However, one portrait of a Parisienne was soon to create extreme controversy. Like Sargent, Virginie Gautreau was American, but she lived in Paris since she was four years old. She was a celebrity, even though she didn't have any particular talent. She did not sing or dance or write or paint, but everyone knew her. She went out of her way to look strange and mysterious. Making her pale skin even paler with layers of lavender powder. Then she added rose colored makeup to her ears. She was so serious about never being seen without her makeup that she had a servant meet her at the water's edge when she went swimming. He would envelop her in a huge towel and carry her to the dressing room. As soon as Sargent saw her, he wanted to paint her. He was sure this portrait would make him famous, and he was right. However, he had no idea what he was in for in the process. Instead of the usual weeks, it took him months. It was very hard for her to sit still, and he just could not find the right pose for her. He drew her sitting, kneeling, reading, playing the piano, before he had her pose standing with her head turned to the side to show off her ear. She had chosen a black dress, which made her pale skin look even paler, and it left her arms, neck, and shoulders bare. Even in Paris at this time, Proper women wore high neck dresses. It was hard for Sargent to get the color right and not make her skin look purple. When the painting was exhibited in the Paris Salon in 1884, Virginie hated it, and so did her mother, who stormed into Sargent's studio, enraged that he had made her daughter look so disgraceful. Sargent had painted the strap on the viewer's left, slipping off her shoulder. To calm her mother, Sargent repainted the strap. However, the French newspapers made so much of the scandal that people would not stop talking to Sargent about it. 
He went to London to escape the controversy and eventually moved there for good. Later, when he sold the painting to the Metropolitan Museum, he removed Virginie's name and simply called it Madame X. His painting of the Miss Vickers would have been refused by the Royal Academy if the judge for the exhibit had not threatened to resign if it had not been hung. When the Pall Mall Gazette asked readers to cast votes for the worst painting in the exhibit, this one received the majority. In London, as in Paris, some of Sargent's best work was often misunderstood. However, he was soon in demand having two or three sitters a day, and during breaks he would relax by playing the piano. Posing for Sargent could be difficult because he needed to please not only the people who were paying him, but also himself. His subjects might be asked to change clothes repeatedly and assume many different poses until he was satisfied. And once he started, however, he painted swiftly. Some critics were harsh in their opinions about Sargent's portraits, rudely commenting on the sitters rather than on the artist's skill. Even Mr. Sargent's skill had not succeeded in making the Orientals in the Meyer group attractive. And the society women, although beautiful, they're thought by some to have cold, selfish eyes. One critic even accused Sargent of being hostile to his subjects, looking on them with the contempt of a prosecuting lawyer. These criticisms reflected the prejudice of the times rather than Sargent's feelings about his subjects. The first of Sargent's paintings purchased by a public museum, the Tate Gallery, was Carnation Lily, Lily Rose. He enjoyed painting portraits of children and his work shows sympathy and understanding, bringing out their charm and simplicity. Although Sargent never married and had no children, he knew how to keep them interested. Sometimes he would dance or play the banjo. One child had to pose 83 times before her portrait was finished. Another was intrigued by the slimrick which Sargent was forced to repeat until he just couldn't stand it. There was a young lady of Spain who often was sick on a train. Not once and again, but again and again, and again and again and again. Sergeant eventually had to have a doll made that looked exactly like the child to take over the job of posing. Even adults were entertained with stories while, that he told while painting. He would often hum, whistle, or sing while he worked. Sometimes he would stop, stand still, stare, and think, and then Suddenly, he would dab his brush and paint, yell, and charge at the canvas, painting ferociously. In 1888, he traveled to Boston, where he continued to be in demand for portraits of the wealthy and famous. Among them was Isabella Stewart Gardner, who seemed intent on annoying him from the start. She wanted a portrait that displayed her sexuality and wickedness, and she was not pleased with his attempts. He was told she was deliberately being difficult so that she could break their contract. When he confronted her, she apologized and became more cooperative. However, her body type was difficult to make attractive. He eventually solved the problem by having her hold her arms like this. In New York, Sargent had gone with a group of friends to see the Spanish dancer Carmen Sita, known for her dramatic and untamed performances. He was determined to paint her, but this was to be another trying experience. Carmen Sita was often childish and sullen and enjoyed changing her expression from angelic to contemptuous. Sergeant tried gaining her cooperation with gifts like gold bracelets. One day in an attempt to break up a spell of sullenness, he began to eat his cigar. She enjoyed this much more than he intended, taunting him to finish it right down to the ash. 
And so this became a ritual each time she came to the studio. And her demand for jewelry had become insatiable. One double-tiered pearl choker had 10 loop strands that hung onto her bosom. In 1893, he was commissioned to paint murals for one of the principal rooms in the newly constructed Boston Public Library, for which he would be paid $15,000. He saw this as a great opportunity in a new and untried field of art. His contract gave him free reign over the project, and he looked forward to working with subjects that could not talk back. Originally, he had considered Spanish literature as his theme. However, he changed his focus and proposed a cycle, which he named the Triumph of Religion, which would depict stages of Jewish and Christian religious history. At the time, there was not a problem representing religious themes in public places. In fact, religious history was seen as an important part of educating the individual socially, politically, and ethically for a role in the ideal society. As one of the library's trustees pointed out, the distinguishing characteristic of the education provided by a public library is that it's not imposed upon the person as, in, as is done in schools and churches. The library educates in response to the individual's personal needs. It was estimated that 10,000 people attended the opening of the library in 1895. Henry James objected that the library was just too free and open to all, giving it the atmosphere of a railway station. He found the presence of children especially upsetting, and they even wanted to take out books. He saw it as a place for private study and thought there should be more areas where this would be possible. With the Library Commission, Sargent could afford to turn down requests for portraits. He could devote all of his energy and attention to studying the literature on his chosen theme and traveling to Egypt and Greece to study the ancient depictions of adultery and polytheism that were to, that were to be represented in the lunette and ceiling of the north end of the hall. An example is his inspiration for the Phoenician goddess Astarte, known in Greek as Aphrodite or Venus. He first read Flaubert's description of her character and then used an archaic statue in Athens as the model for her appearance. The work was done in a studio near London. The first section was exhibited at the Royal Academy before it was put in place in Boston. Sargent was to work in this project on and off for years, traveling back and forth between the US and England. He was trying to show thousands of years of history in these paintings, telling a story, and then painting actual people and places. Today, people do not consider these murals to be his best work, but to him, it was the most important. Sargent was made an associate of the Royal Academy in 1894, an elected Royal Accommodation and National Accommodation in America in 1897, honors that show the admiration of his professional colleagues. He was responsible for changes in the Royal Academy exhibitions. Fewer pictures were hung so that the walls were not so crowded and the sculptures were better displayed. In 1910, William Barton stated in his essay, The Library as a Minister in the Field of Religious Art, every public library should have, few pic have a few pictures. These, of course, cannot be sectarian, but there's no reason why they cannot be religious. All of them should appeal to something high and noble in human life. The sergeant's paintings at the, B that the Boston Public Library suggest an entirely unobjectionable range of pictures for any public library. In fact, the fine row of profit is displayed in framed photogra photographs in many public libraries. In the spring of 1916, he set sail for Boston 
bringing within the series of the Madonna to the walls and ceiling of the south end of the hall and the series of six lunettes. The canvases painted in London were rolled to be transported to Boston. There, Sargent attached them to yards of ribbed corduroy to make the diffusion of light more interesting than it would have been had they been, had they been hung on a flat surface. They were hung by a process called mouthwash, where the top of each was tacked along the upper edge of the wall space and the canvas rolled up to the tacking. The wall beneath was given a thick coat of white lead and then the canvas already prepared with red lead on the reverse side was allowed to roll down into place. So when it dried, the murals became part of the wall. Sargent worked daily on scaffolding in the library, modeling and gilding every bit of ornament and repainting whole passages. He allowed the public to see his work at Christmas time, but he was reluctant to do this. He would gladly have spent another year perfecting it. Everyone recognized the originality of this project and the ability and the scholarship that went into creating it. A modest man, he declined to speak at a dinner honoring him. He did not initiate conversation about his work and answered questions from those at his table briefly. He was asked why he had wanted the lighting in the sergeant hall to be dim. He replied that when he had seen the paintings in the crude light of the Royal Academy, they had not looked well to him. Sargent had planned that the final large panel would represent the Sermon on the Mount. On either side would be church and synagogue. He had not foreseen the controversy that these two side panels, which were hung first, would create. The Jewish community strongly objected to the depiction in synagogue of a muscular female, dissolute and dressed in the richly textured ribbon veil of the temple clutching tablets of the law. Roman Catholics were equally offended by his depiction of the Blessed Virgin in the other panel. Although she was perhaps more attractive, her expression was cold and she stared straight ahead without seeing. Holding conventional Eucharistic symbols, she seemed oblivious to the suffering of her son. What Sargent was trying to show in these two panels in relation to the Sermon on the Mount was the shift from observance of obsolete law and doctrine, convention bound forms of religious, religious expression to individualism and personal spirituality. He believed the kingdom of God within each individual was the social ideal toward which history advanced. Opposition to the synagogue panel moved through three stages. First, there was a short-lived campaign for signatures requesting that the mural be removed. And then from October 1919 to April 1920, there were a series of resolutions and official actions from various national and regional organizations directed to the library trustees, the mayor of Boston, and even the governor of Massachusetts. Of course, most of these groups had never seen the panel and did not understand the context of the exhibit. In response to the controversy, the library trustees pointed out that they could not legally remove the panel since their contract with Sargent had guaranteed complete freedom. They stated that this, the panel was symbolic and in harmony with the rules of art as pictured for centuries in Europe and also involved were all the citizens who had contributed funds. In July 1920, Tana Sculptor Rose Kohler designed a reputation of synagogue. In her medallion, the crown is firmly placed on the central figure whose scepter is unbroken and whose eyes look into the future as she holds aloft the scroll of law. It's interesting that the inscription, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples, stresses a universalistic idea, which is similar to that which Sargent had seen as the conclusion of triumph. From November 1921 to April 1924, a sequence of legislative initiatives were brought before the House and Senate of the Commonwealth. 
Prominent Jewish leaders were supported by non-Jews in both political and religious spheres. When House Bill 1131 called for removal of the panel, an attorney pointed out that this would be deemed unconstitutional. And so the bill was revised to remove the painting by right of eminent domain for use in the Massachusetts public schools. This bill passed in both the House and the Senate and was signed into law. It is proposed to preserve the painting as a work of art and the production of a great artist. The State Board of Education can use the painting in connection with courses on art, but it is evident that its historical motive is wrong and therefore it should not be used in teaching history. Both Christians and Jews were dismayed over the agitation and people of both faiths sent letters to the trustees to support Sargent. One letter from a prominent Jewish leader stated, I resent the agitation which has resulted in this hypocritical measure. I should be very glad to contribute to a fund to test the constitutionality of this law. The court did eventually rule that the state had no right to take the painting, but in the meantime, other issues are being addressed. It was concluded that it would be impossible to remove this panel without damaging it. And therefore, furthermore, the schools did not want it. They could see no practical use for it, and they did not want the responsibility of such a valuable work of art. They were worried about taking on the controversy associated with it. They also recognized that it should not be separated from the general theme of the work. And so, in 1924, Leverett Salt installed presented to the House a bill calling for the repeal of the synagogue bill. The preamble to this bill is very significant. It read, it is the sense of the general court that no pictures involving possible religious discussions or controversies be removed to or otherwise placed in public buildings. This would be an emergency law ensuring that it would go into effect immediately. However, to avoid a problem with religious art that was already in public buildings, the Senate amended the preamble. It is the sense of the general court that works of art, which by their nature and character, reflect on any race or class, should not be placed in public buildings. Race is used instead of religion, because at that time Jews were seen as a race rather than a religion. Two months before the repeal, a vandal splattered the panel with ink. A small amount of damage is easily repaired by Sargent himself and a guard was stationed near the painting. To avoid additional controversy, Sargent never finished the cycle. Sargent had not devoted all of his time to triumph. During this period, he was also free to work in watercolor on landscapes. He traveled widely, returning many times to Venice, where he was inspired to paint nearly 150 scenes. In 1917, Sargent chose Nolan to restore an oil, oil painting that he cracked badly. Nolan refused to take money for this work. A friend suggested that Nolan would treasure a portrait. When Sargent offered to do a charcoal sketch, Nolan cleverly replied, you know, I love your drawings, but my wife and I are both Irish. If we were to be having a discussion and she were to throw her shoe at me, and it happened to hit your charcoal drawing, it would be ruined forever. However, if it were an oil painting, I could repair it. Sargent was amused and agreed to do this oil sketch. The sketches for the unfinished panel, The Sermon on the Mount, show Jesus seated among adults and children. When a collection of his paintings were bequeathed to the National Gallery, it created a controversy. It had been a practice to not exhibit the work of living artists, but trustees declared this was not a rule. In 1923, a cartoon in Punch showed a group of artists, including Rembrandt, Van Dyck, Reynolds, and Gainsborough, on the steps of the National Gallery, 
saluting Sergeant as he ascended, hailing the newcomer with, well done, you're the first master to get here alive. Many famous people offered Sergeant great sums of money to paint their portraits. When he refused, they increased the amount, but he was tired of painting portraits and focused on a medium in which he could express himself freely. Watercolor allowed him to capture a vast array of settings from marble quarries to waterfronts to desert scenes. In 1916, Sargent had been hired by the MFA to paint murals there and create sculptures. He was to work on this project for the rest of his life. At the same time, the British government asked him to do a painting of British and American soldiers fighting side by side. Since he had no idea what war was like, he went to France where the battle was raging to find out. What he saw changed his idea of what he would paint. He saw a long line of soldiers waiting to see a doctor. Poison gas had burned their eyes and skin. He called the painting Gasp. It is 20 feet long and shows more than 60 soldiers, and it was to be his last great painting. In the early hours of the morning of April 15, 1925, Sargent was found dead in bed by his parlor maid. His reading glasses were pushed up on his forehead, and a book by Voltaire was at his side. He had worked in his studio as usual the day before, had dinner at his sister's house, and left at 10 o'clock to walk the short distance to his home. The cause of death was heart failure. A solemn high mass was sung in the Church of St. John the Evangelist in Boston at the same time as the memorial service in Westminster Abbey. Many recall the examples of Sargent's kindness and generosity. A fellow artist explained that he had written to Sargent asking for a few words of advice and he enclosed a sketch of the space he was working on. On the following morning, before the artist even expected an answer, Sargent appeared on the scaffolding where the man was working, several hours distant from London. Sargent had canceled his appointments and taken an early train to help his friend. Always a very private man, Sargent had refused to cooperate with authors who wanted to write his biography and he destroyed his diaries and correspondence, sometimes so quickly that the dates of social invitations were lost. But he probably did not mind missing these events. In the early 1990s, the Sargent Gallery at the Boston Public Library had become a storage area filled with filing cabinets and dust. It wasn't until 2004 that work was done to restore the panels. This work, which took 18 months, involved painstakingly rubbing away years of dust, air pollutants, and smoke from the nearby Back Bay Railroad. This was done inch by inch with cotton swabs and special cleaning solutions. One of the painting conservators explained, we're not just dealing with paintings, we're dealing with sculptures as well. Sergeant Hall has sculptures extending up to 12 inches off the canvas and Sargent used glass, wood, metal, and a variety of paints to create these murals. The bookcases, wall coverings, and natural and artificial lighting, right down to the brass fixtures, had all been designed by Sargent to enhance the experience of viewing Triumph of Religion. The restoration staff also worked to restore the lighting so that the murals could be viewed just as Sargent planned. If you hold on, we're going to play two videos, which you may or not may not be able to hear.
So do you think we're good? We got Okay. So you stop recording. That's the end of it. All right. Oh, still recording. Uh oh.